This presentation will involve uh, a mixture of some of my own projects and performances, but also interesting cutting edge uh, research in science, engineering, IT, um, that's relevant to the subject. As a performance artist, I've always been interested in the notion of the body as a kind of evolutionary architecture um, that gradually becomes aware and operates effectively in the world. And this idea uh, also is premised on the fact that the body is not particularly well designed. I mean, there's some obvious examples, one standing before you. Um, this body has to uh, uh, take in gulps of air constantly uh, to survive. If it loses 10% of its body fluids, it's dead. If its internal temperature varies three or four degrees, it's in serious health risk. Its longevity is limited. Um, we live to an average of 75 years in good health and then we gradually deteriorate and die. Now this is a problem if you're already 68. <laughs> it's also a time of what I call circulating flesh. Uh, for example, uh, the blood flowing in my body today may be circulating in your body tomorrow if you happen to be O positive. We can extract organs from one body and insert them into another body. Um, at a medical conference in Paris about 12 years ago, I met the first double hand transplant. Uh, we can actually stitch the hands of a cadaver onto the limbs of, of, of another person and reanimate them. After six months, uh, this person had a rudimentary sense of touch, of pressure, of, 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 of heat sensitivity, and he could uh, animate uh, the cadaver fingers. So it's very disconcerting. If you've had a, a kidney transplant, it doesn't affect our social interaction. If I have to shake the hands of a person um, whose hands came from the body of, of someone previously deceased, then it might be a bit more problematic. So it's a time of, of circulating flesh. The lengthy process of approximately one year to ensure that he met the true criteria to be the right patient for this transplant. And sure enough, he did meet this criteria. At that time, we described a procedure which would essentially restore everything which was not functioning and appearing normal on his face, which included portions of the scalp through the forehead, the upper lower eyelids, the nose, upper lower lips, soft tissues of the chin, down to the level of the neck, and the underlying structures, which included the upper jaw, bones around the eye sockets, the upper teeth, the lower teeth, as well as the anterior portions of the tongue. Dr. Rodriguez, uh, he suffered a, a gunshot uh, accident back in 1997. Uh, amazingly, his, his sight wasn't affected. His, he still had his vision, but as you say, he, could, he can now uh, smell something he probably hasn't been able to do, what, for, for 15 years. He is, he's now talking. Uh, tell us about uh, the moment that, that he was able to do these things. So the face from the donor body stitched onto the skull of the recipient becomes a kind of third face, resembling neither. And we know now that we can uh, preserve a body forever if we plastinate it. Um, and we can display it anatomically in ways that we couldn't before. But as well as preserve a cadaver pretty much indefinitely, we can also sustain a comatose body on a life support system. And at the same time, cry cryogenically preserve bodies um, to awaken them at some imagined future. So there's a real blurring of not only what it means to be alive, but actually what it, what it, what it means to be dead. Uh, there's a real blurring of, 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 of that condition. Um, we can also radically repair the body, uh, for example, by tissue engineering. Uh, parts of our organs or parts of our, our, our heart muscles using stem cells and even uh, bioprinting, which I'll talk about a little later. So 
At the same time that we're in this age of circulating flesh, we're also in a time of what I call fractal flesh and phantom flesh. And by fractal flesh, I mean bodies and bits of bodies, spatially separated but electronically connecting, connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. And by phantom flesh, I mean not only performing as our avatars on the internet, but with the increasing pro proliferation of haptic devices, uh, this will generate a much more potent physical presence of remote bodies. Now we, we, can, we can communicate by text, by Skyping. I imagine being able to feel the person that you're speaking to remotely. And these haptic devices are, are making this uh, possible. Um, some other interesting de developments have been in, 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 the, um, in the research of developing flexible uh, circuitry. Uh, flexible circuitry that's deformable and that can be stuck uh, onto the body. And this has kind of been popularly called epidermal electronics. A team of scientists led by University of Illinois professor John Rogers has created a new, less intrusive way of gathering data from the human body. Unlike conventional equipment that hardwires patients to a stationary machine, the epidermal electronics, as they're called, attach to the skin in the same way you would attach a temporary tattoo. Our thought was that if you could convert the electronics from the rigid boxy form that exists today into a format that looks like the skin in terms of mechanical properties, uh, shape, uh, stretchability, toughness, uh, then you could almost make like a second skin that would laminate on the surface of the uh, biological skin in a completely seamless, integrated fashion. So these circuits can pick up, for example, body functions and wirelessly transmit them. Uh, and recently, John Rogers has not only developed a, a flexible, deformable circuit, but also a biodegradable one. So for example, if you've got a pathological uh, condition, structural condition with your heart, uh, an electrode or a circuit can be stuck on the surface of your heart, in, inside your body. It can monitor your body, uh, wirelessly transmit information uh, to the, to the, to the uh, medical uh, person. Uh, and then three or four weeks later, the circuit harmlessly biodegrades into the body. If the substrate is, is silk, if the circuit is printed in magnesium, if it's insulated with silicon dioxide, then it's totally biodegradable inside the body. Incoming transmission from Autobot Headquarters. Autobot Headquarters. This is Optimus Prime. Do you read me? We cannot win this war without your help. Megatron must be stopped. Soundwave is attempting to jam this signal. Answer before it's too late. Incoming transmission from Autobot headquarters. This is Optimus Prime. Do you read me? So the system just does head detection and then virtually skins the head or masks the head in this case. So in a future of augmented reality, uh, you'll be wearing virtual clothing as well as your, your physical clothing. Um, and uh, okay, up until now you need a cumbersome head up display, perhaps Google glasses, but recently they've developed um, a contact lens uh, with inserted micro LEDs that can, tra that can actually display bits of data, sort of arrows and simple bits of text in your field of vision. And no one's gonna know, <laughs> uh, know whether you, you are, your vision is being augmented or not. Uh, so one of the problems with Google Glasses, of course, is the, the social problem. You know, if someone's wearing something and you think they're recording you or they're, um, you know, the system is doing stuff that you don't really want to be involved with, uh, there's nothing much, you know, you can't really tell. Uh, but uh, it's going to get worse because with implantable devices, uh, then it's going to be extremely difficult to detect. And we have to take into account 
for example, that our bodies are going to be increasingly augmented by implantable uh, technology. My own third hand was the first um, uh, uh, attachment to my body that uh, I engineered. And when this project was completed, it was sophisticated enough uh, that uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab in uh, Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, invited me to demonstrate the hand to the extravehicular activity group. It's actuated by electrodes on the um, abdominal and leg muscles. Uh, so by controlling those muscle signals, generating muscle signals, uh, you can uh, produce different hand movements. Uh, this is just a, a, a visual uh, performance. Uh, but I did learn to do things, in this case, writing one word with three hands, each hand writing a separate letter at the same time. Had to keep my two eyes on what my three hands were doing. Um, and uh, also, of course, uh, each letter was written at a different speed because each letter uh, was of a different complexity. I only learned to write two words, evolution and decadence, because these were both nine-letter words. And a performance where uh, my third hand uh, is attached and laser beams are, uh, are directed to my eyes using optic fiber cable. Uh, and these laser beams are pulsing to my heartbeat sound. So boom, boom, pulsing on and off. But by controlling the movements of the muscles around the eyes, you could scribble images in the space uh, with the laser beams. So the eyes are not passive receptors of light and images, but rather actively generate images uh, in the space. And the sounds that you'll hear are amplified brainwaves, heartbeat, blood flow, muscle signals. Uh, but the, the, if you can imagine, the, uh, the sounds vary from um, uh, boom, 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 and And if the speaker system would allow me, that sound would be reverberating uh, and vibrating your skin and bones. Uh, in these performances, the sound is not only immersive, but it's physically uh, affecting the body. Uh, not only did I devise uh, attachments to my body, but in 1993 for the 5th Australian Sculpture Triennale, I designed a sculpture for the inside of my body. Uh, the theme of the Sculpture Triennale was site-specific works. Instead of a sculpture for a public space, I designed a sculpture for my own private physiological space. Um, it had to fully close to be safely inserted down, the down past the esophagus into the stomach cavity. But once inside the stomach, the sculpture opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. And you'll be glad to hear, I'm not showing the video. <laughs> I, I had to subtract lots of, it, lots of stuff from this uh, performance and that was something that perhaps you could do without. Uh, the sculpture is about the size of a small fist. Uh, here my hands are much closer to the camera so uh, the sculpture looks smaller. But it has a flashing light and a beeping sound. So you have to imagine this as a simple machine choreography inside a soft and wet uh, part of the body and a clean shot of the inside of my stomach. Uh, what began as uh, an artistic experiment quickly deteriorated into a medical melodrama <laughs> when the uh, endoscopist dis uh, uh, discovered a polyp growing in my stomach. Uh, fortunately, the polyp was benign. Um, a project that I've initiated uh, at Brunel University in London, where I, where I was at last year, which is an ongoing project now in collaboration with, with our uh, alternate anatomies lab here at Curtin, is the ambidextrous arm. Uh, 
Now, imagine uh, a universal uh, uh, manipulator whose fingers bend one way, the thumb rotates, you've got a right hand, but the fingers can bend completely the other way, the thumb can rotate backwards, so you've got a left hand and a right hand all in one, um, and uh, of course combinations of those. Um, and here we, we're uh, doing some testing, this was the first testing we did uh, late last year, and it, it'll show how fingers can ambidextrously bend one way and the other. And uh, the idea being that a prosthesis now, you have to either design it as a right hand or a left hand. Uh, here you have a prosthesis of, of a universal design. It's both left handed and right handed all in one. Uh, but I, I guess too in the near future, uh, it won't be simply us mimicking the capabilities of our missing limb but rather developing technological attachments. Uh, imagine uh, 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 a limb with continuous wrist rotation or ambidextrous fingers or, or extendable fingers. Uh, so these are all possibilities now and um, this is happening uh, with, um, with us at Brunel University and at Curtin. Uh, my extended arm project, which was a sort of an earlier project, um, if you can imagine this as an 11 degree of freedom manipulator, where you have wrist rotation, thumb rotation, individual finger flexion, but in addition, each finger splits open. So each finger, theory in, uh, theoretically, is a gripper in itself. Each finger can pick up something individually, right? And um, in this performance, my left arm is computer controlled, uh, sending 15 to 50 volts of electricity uh, to the left side of my body. So in this performance, my left arm is involuntarily moving, pre-programmed, computer controlled. I can forget what this arm is doing and concentrate on controlling my extended arm. So voltage in, involuntary movements, uh, voltage out, controlling an extended arm. Uh, this performance, in fact, was for four hours continuously. Uh, it was also uh, web streamed. Uh, you'll see uh, on, on the video screen a 3D model of the manipulator. And this mimicked the movements of the actual uh, hand. Uh, so if you're online viewing the performance, you would see the video streaming of the performance and you would see the 3D model mimicking the movements. The sounds, and there are lots of them. Uh, the sounds are generated not by internal signals, but rather by sensors on the limbs. So it's the choreography of the limbs that generate the signals that are acoustically translated. So position orientation sensors, flexion sensors, uh, ultrasound sensors generate that uh, sound. Um, it didn't take much imagination, but I'm not sort of showing these in a logical time uh, stream, but this is going backwards in time actually, um, where uh, I thought, well, if we can uh, program the body in a local space, perhaps we can remote control the body from another location. So this is the muscle stimulation box. The blue switches indicate uh, which muscles can be actuated, uh, computer programmed. And by touching the, the uh, touch screen interface, by touching the model on the computer screen, the computer model mimics what you've just programmed and a second later in my body moves in Luxembourg. Uh, I was in Luxembourg, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference um, uh, uh, in Amsterdam were able to access my body, remotely activate it. Uh, and this was a performance that went over uh, two days to allow those three cities to interact effectively. And I was wearing a head-up display, which meant that I could see the face of the person who was moving me and there were malicious agents on the internet, uh, especially those who were disbelieving of the system and kept programming 
the same movement over and over again. And, you know, doing that for half an hour was not, you know, very pleasant and quite fatiguing. Um, so in, in, in these performances, the body kind of performs in a posture of indifference. By that I mean, uh, you know, uh, that the performance is structured but not scripted. Uh, you allow the performance to unfold in its own time with its own rhythm. And the body is partly possessed and partly performing with its own agency. So again, voltage in, uh, voltage out. I've always been interested in um, uh, uh, animal and insect locomotion. Uh, and uh, in 1997, uh, the year that I did a residency here at Curtin, uh, we developed a six-legged walking machine uh, with uh, a, a group of uh, engineer friends in Hamburg, uh, robust enough to support the artist's body. And the upper body exoskeleton of this, uh, of this robot enabled the artist to control the leg movements by making different arm gestures. So you were changing the leg movements and the direction the robot was moving by making different arm uh, gestures. And this robot, uh, it was actually the first performance at the time that I did with my clothes on. <laughs> and the reason for this was that when I first got on the robot naked, uh, it was hitting the concrete so hard that the shock waves passing through my body were really difficult to bear. Uh, and I already had a lower back problem, so it was very uncomfortable. And the only way that I could stand on the robot was to wear shockproof boots. And when I realised that I had to wear shockproof boots, I thought it prudent to also wear clothing, much to the disgust of artist friends who thought I should have been on the machine with boots on only. Uh, another kind of walking machine, um, this time more physically coupled, and this is a machine that's actually five metres in diameter. So you can imagine a machine that wide in diameter, uh, five metres, and that was actuated by pneumatic rubber muscles. Um, so a steel cylinder this big would weigh like 15 kilograms. A rubber muscle this long weighs about you know, 500 grams with the uh, aluminium couplers at the end. So by inflating the rubber muscle, uh, the rubber muscle expands in girth, contracts 20% of its length, producing a strong pulling force. By organising these muscles antagonistically, you are able to generate walking movements. And this is the little kind of animation that indicates how that was done. By lifting one leg up, three robot legs lift and swing forward. So the robot is always stable because three legs are on the ground. But by stepping up and down on the spot, you could get the robot to walk and uh, sensors in the chassis detected which way the artist was facing and the robot walks in the direction that the artist is, is looking. Um, this is a small autonomous robot called the walking head, uh, a bit of a chimera in that it has a human head but six, a six-legged insect-like locomotion. And this robot, uh, with its ultrasound sensor, detects if someone's in the gallery space. If someone's in the room, the robot stands up, selects from a possible a library of, of, of choreography, and performs for about a minute and a half, then sits down, goes to sleep, waits for the next person to be detected. And a project that uh, is currently uh, being engineered um, I did initially get Arts Council funding to begin this project, uh, but couldn't complete it. We now have f uh, additional funding uh, from Europe to work on it this year. But the idea is to develop a small micro robot, uh, robust enough to climb up my tongue and into my mouth. I just have to remember not to swallow. We are making several of these just in case. Um, <laughs> And the performance will be video streamed. Um, the, the little robot will have a webcam mounted on the front, so it'll be able to film uh, the actual uh, insertion into the body. I mean, it's really a sort of a crude gesture 
to our increasing intimacy with our machines. Our machines are no longer going to be external to our bodies. Increasingly, micro-miniaturised and nano-sized machines will inhabit the internal spaces of the body. In fact, most technology in the future will be invisible because it will be inside the body. And we'll be able to uh, recolonize the human body with nano sensors and nano machines and augment our bacterial and viral populations. We already have three kilograms of bacterial uh, uh, population on the surface and inside the body. We'll probably more than double that, so uh, be ready for a weight increase. This video is a short overview of the quadruped locomotion control framework developed at USC as part of the DARPA Learning Locomotion Project. This project aims to push the performance of robotic legged locomotion to a new level. The locomotion controller, developed at the Computational Learning and Motor Control Lab at USC, is able to autonomously navigate and cross very challenging terrain. Um, now, what's interesting about this and what's rather uncanny is that it's obviously a machine, it's even got a handle on it, and yet the locomotion is seductively uh, real. In fact, it's, it's an area of robotics which we're also employing uh, called biomimicry. So by studying insect and animal locomotion and, and human uh, body, um, you're able to produce robots that not only merely replicate, but perhaps even go beyond some of the capabilities. So he, here, in fact, the, um, the robot is, is learning uh, to best traverse this kind of rugged bit of terrain. So this robot actually has learning capabilities. And this robot is very interesting uh, because it's insect-like, but its wheels are a combination of, of legs and wheels. So that was truly designed as a, as a very robust uh, robot that uh, can clamper over obstacles, go upstairs, uh, jump uh, fairly high with its springy uh, feet. Um, and then in the realm of, of, of human robotics, um, we have this problem of the uncanny valley. Uh, as you make a robot more and more human-like, it begins to, to sort of get somewhat more and more creepy. Um, uh, partly because it, it isn't quite successful in its, in its asynchronous speech, in its metallic sounding voice, uh, in its sort of non-recognition of, of, of its interlocutor. So, um, yeah, it's slightly out of sync with, with human behaviour, so it, 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 it's, it seems a bit creepy. Now, is this a philosophical problem or a state-of-the-art technology problem? I kind of think it's more of a state-of-the-art technology problem. I don't think there's any philosophical barrier to producing humanoid robots that are uh, kind of realistic and, and can interact with us. Uh, I mean, look, there's a lot of creepy people in the world as well. <laughs> Socially maladjusted people who would perform as badly as a robot interacting with us. Uh, so I really think it's a, it's a technical issue. But uh, uh, David Hansen, who I um, met in, in Dallas when I was there last year, um, 32 micromotors produce a full range of, of facial uh, human emotions and also it actually can speak with you as well. So it has lip syncing facial expressions and in its eyeballs there are miniature cameras. So it can detect a person and even do face recognition. Uh, so obviously it's a much more seductive interactive robot if it has those uh, feedback capabilities. So for me, as, as, uh, you know, a zombie is a body without a mind of its own that performs largely involuntarily. Um, a cyborg is this human machine system which becomes increasingly automated. We've always... Uh, been afraid of, of, the, of the zombie body, of the involuntary body, uh, and we've always been anxious of, of, of becoming cyborgs. But in fact, um, we have always been prosthetically augmented bodies 
and also, in reality, we've always been bodies without minds of our own. What you're looking at now is a zombie-like body. There's nothing inside my head. You know, anything that's meaningful is occurring in the interaction between you and me, in the medium of language that in, within which we're communicating, in the social institutions that we're operating in, in the culture that we've been conditioned. There's absolutely nothing. This body is empty, obsolete, uh, and probably performs better as its avatar on the internet. Um, so, and also this body is already uh, uh, a prosthetically augmented body. We all have wireless devices which allow us to punch numbers and all of a sudden, instantly, we're speaking to someone in another country elsewhere. Um, we take these things for granted, but in fact, um, that's what we, we, we've already become. The Extra Ear project was a project, in fact, that was imaged at Curtin University in 1997 when I did my residency here. Um, and uh, originally it was imaged as an ear on the side of my head. Uh, this proved to be uh, a rather unsafe place to have an ear, uh, partly because of the nerve endings. Uh, you know, no surgeon was willing to do this. Uh, it might have resulted in partial face paralysis. I always imagined if this project was going to happen, it was either going to happen in Thailand, where I could just um, you know, throw a lot of money at someone to do, the, to do the procedure, or perhaps in Brazil, where they do radical sex change operations. Now, had it happened in Brazil, upon awakening, I might have wondered uh, what organ had been stitched to the side of my head. I've been called those names before. <laughs> but fortunately, uh, there was no slippage into monstrosity. Uh, except that in 2006, uh, I did get funding from a London production company um, to actually surgically construct an ear on my arm. And uh, here, the scaffold is, uh, uh, it's a very porous biomaterial. When you insert it beneath the skin, when you suction the skin over the scaffold, over a period of six months, you have what's called uh, tissue uh, in-growth and vascularization occurring. So uh, this ear, in fact, uh, it's only a relief of an ear. I don't know if the lighting really shows it. You can maybe have a bit look at it later. Um, but uh, uh, it's only a relief of an ear. We still have to surgically lift uh, the helix to create an ear flap. And then we're also going to grow a soft earlobe using my adult stem cells. Um, and uh, You'll see at the end of this video that uh, and what we're doing now is inserting a microphone into the ear construct. So at the end of this little video, you'll see the surgeon, even though he has a, has a, a, a surgical mask on, even though my arm is being wrapped in bandage with a partial plaster cast, uh, he speaks into my ear. His voice is picked up and wirelessly transmitted. So the idea eventually will be to rewire this ear when it's a fully three-dimensional ear so that it becomes internet enabled in any Wi-Fi hotspot. <laughs> so if you're here in Perth and I'm in London or Melbourne, wherever I am, wherever you are, you'll be able to uh, you know, find, me, find the ear online because it will have a GPS as well, hopefully still attached to this body and you'll be able to listen in to what the ear is hearing. Um, so for me, this project is only interesting after that's, uh, that's successful. But what we've done is replicated a bodily structure, relocated it, and hopefully rewiring it for additional capabilities. Um, now, the title of the lab, Alternate Anatomies Lab, uh, might be uh, becoming clearer to you. I showed this ear to my two-year-old niece, and uh, she sort of intently sort of looked at the ear and then immediately wanted to examine the side of my head, you know, as if one had slipped off the side of my head and then it ended up on my arm. Um, so this uh, project also generated some additional kind of unexpected performances and projects. 
Uh, by la laser scanning uh, my arm and ear, uh, I was able to laser cut a four metre uh, large sculpture which was exhibited at the Lawn uh, Sculpture Triennale in, in Victoria. Uh, and they kind of asked me if I'd do a performance. Uh, and so I decided to simply lie on the sculpture. My body was uh, covered with clay, white clay. Over a period of about an hour, of course, the clay cracks because of the body heat. So it left a, a, you know, a, a kind of an interesting uh, image of a full body uh, counter, you know, counterbalanced on a large uh, a fragment of the body, which was an ear on an arm. But whilst I was lying on this uh, sculpture, um, I had this uh, sort of somewhat sort of uh, fatal idea that instead of just lying on the sculpture, that it might be more interesting if I suspended my body over the sculpture. And with the, the help of some uh, two very good friends, um, 16 hooks were inserted um, into my back and legs. And um, when everything was ready, uh, the hooks were connected to a pulley structure and uh, the body was winched up. Now, as the body, uh, as the cable takes the full weight of the body, because the cable is braided, the cable, uh, the, the cable begins to untwist. And as it untwists, the body begins to turn. I thought it would take about five minutes for me to stop spinning. Uh, unfortunately, it took about 15 minutes to stop spinning because the body spun in one direction, increased in speed, and then spun in the other direction, increased in speed. Uh, gradually, it stopped uh, fortuitously about in the same position uh, as uh, I was uh, hoisted up, and uh, the, the performance ended when the body was lowered down. Imatic Face Station is the revolutionary new way to create 3D facial animation. When you provide Face Station with video of an actor speaking into a camera, Face Station automatically creates matching facial animation in a 3D animation package, from a smile, to surprise, to a frown. The actor literally drives the 3D character. It's that simple and that amazing. So it's real-time motion capture, uh, no markers on the face, uh, just simply a camera looking at the actor, uh, analysing his, his facial expressions and lip movements, and then mapping them to the virtual, uh, to the virtual model. Um, this was sort of state-of-the-art uh, uh, some years ago, and this is two chatbots talking to each other. Hello there. Hi. How are you? Great, you. I'm okay. That's good. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverbot. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverbot. I am a robot. Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. But you said earlier that you were a robot. I did not. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd, since memory shouldn't be a problem for you. I've answered all your questions. No, you haven't. What is God to you? Not everything. Not everything could also be something. For example, not everything could be half of something, which is still something, and therefore not nothing. Very true. I would like to imagine it is. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. So you're Christian? No, I am not. But you say you are not helpful, therefore you are a meaning. Why you say it or tea? That does not make sense. Don't you want to have a body? Sure. Or if what? <laughs> so what one, you know, even though the logic here is more charming than fully rational, it does indicate that, you know, an artificial intelligence can speak to itself and of course, uh, communicate with people and other robots uh, in the very near future. My own prosthetic head project 
uh, which I can't really demonstrate tonight, but uh, this has eyeballs, uh, separate uh, tongue and teeth. Uh, we had produced uh, somewhat the likeness of the artist by uh, a stretching, uh, a wrapping the skin um, uh, around the 12,000 polygon model. And if we were to do this now, we would simply just instantly scan the face using either uh, a white light scanner or a, or a laser scanner, producing an instant skin which could be animated. So now we could literally, in, in, in minutes, scan your face and animate your face or animate the skin of your face. And over any AV you know, phone or TV monitor, you would not know whether that person was real speaking to you or not. The performance that I'm going to show is a performance with my prosthetic head where I'm using a Kinect sensor which is recognising my arm gestures. And my arm gestures are animating the movements of the head and generating the sounds that it's producing, including some singing sounds. So what's interesting for me is, is what sort of vocabularies of behaviour generate a sense of aliveness. So, you know, a few eye blinks, head nods, um, you know, uh, lip movements, and all of a sudden uh, what's, you know, obviously a, a 3D model and computer animation generates a sense of, of aliveness. And, and the same uh, with robotics. What sort of minimum uh, 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 vocabulary of, of behaviour can generate this, uh, this aliveness. And just to sort of finish off, the organ printing um, research now being done uh, promises to bioprint not only tissue uh, but even organs of the body in the future. And um, by printing, instead of with cartridges of coloured ink, uh, cartridges of living cells. You print layer by layer on biodegradable paper. As the paper biodegrades, the cells fuse and you end up with a printed part of a trachea or a, or a, or a, or a, a vein or an artery. And because this is using cells derived from your own body, uh, there's no immunological problem with uh, transplanting them. And if we uh, can provide the computer and the bioprinter with adequate uh, information on the 3D structure, uh, the tissue types uh, and so on of, of an organ as complex as the heart, uh, then Hewlett and Packard promises to, to develop an organ printer. 
Here it's printed a heart. That's only half the problem, of course. We then have to dump the heart into a vat of nutrients at 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, we have to electrically stimulate it, provide a blood supply. Hopefully the heart starts beating and then it can be uh, transplanted. So there's already been experiments uh, printing uh, uh, simple tissue um, and uh, especially for burn, burns victims, uh, this is a very important development. So as a summary of all this, um, this is really a time where we're sort of intervening uh, in, in very radical ways uh, into uh, uh, how living things operate and how uh, living things um, uh, survive. For example, we can now remote control in insects by implanting, for example, an 8-bit processor uh, into the brain of a cockroach. We can actually direct uh, where that cockroach moves, where it walks. And by mounting a little webcam on its back, it's instantly a surveillance object, uh, a surveillance instrument. Um, we can also remote control the movements, the flight, of a moth. This has already been done uh, by controlling uh, the, the, uh, the, the muscle, uh, the, the rate of frequency the muscles, uh, the muscles flapping the wings. So that can all be computer controlled. Um, we, we're now growing human livers in rats so we can do pharmacological experiments. That means you can do safe experiments uh, on, on, on a diseased liver uh, without harming a human body, you're doing it in the, in the unfortunate lab, lab animal. Um, skin cells can now become sperm cells. We can take the skin cell from an impotent male and recode it into a sperm cell. But more interestingly, we can take the skin cell from a female body and turn it into a sperm cell. <laughs> which means males are out of the reproductive loop. <laughs> uh, um, recently, there have been uh, 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 nano-sized robots uh, who are propelled by bacteria stuck to their chassis. So we're using microorganisms to propel micro-robots, nano-sized robots, in fact. Um, Robots with bio brains. I went to Reading University uh, where they were doing experiments on uh, imagine growing um, uh, a, a brain in an incubator in a laboratory, uh, growing rat neurons over a grid of electrodes, and that uh, growing brain in the incubator is wirelessly controlling a robot moving around in some other part of the building, or for that matter, some other part of the country or, or global location. So we're now developing robots with bio brains that can uh, learn basic things like avoiding obstacles. Um, and so we're kind of combining uh, machine and living systems uh, to cooperate. And increasingly now people will become uh, uh, internet portals of experience. Imagine if you could, see, if I could see with the eyes of someone in London, if I could hear with the ears of someone in New York, while someone in Tokyo is remotely accessing my arm and remotely activating it, performing some t collaborative task with me, uh, hopefully not a criminal one, um, and uh, whilst with my right hand I can uh, tweet friends uh, 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 elsewhere. So the idea of the body's experience uh, no longer being uh, due to the location that it occupies, nor its own personal sensory apparatus. Your experience is this uh, pastiche of uh, of, of perceptual experiences uh, from different sensory systems elsewhere. And about a year and a half ago, uh, the first turbine heart was inserted into the chest 
of a patient in the United States. And this patient was terminally ill and died uh, some days later, but it wasn't due to the uh, artificial heart. Um, but this heart is a smaller, more robust and more reliable than previous artificial hearts. The interesting thing though is that it circulates the blood through the body uh, continuously without pulsing. So in the future you might rest your head on your loved one's chest. They're warm to the touch, they're breathing, they're certainly alive, they have no heartbeat. <laughs> Um, but I would like to mention what we're doing in the Alternate Anatomies Lab. Um, this is a lab that um, I initiated um, at the end of last year at Curtin. And um, it was an idea that, that would try to focus uh, the sorts of activities that we were involved in. And uh, firstly, it's an interdisciplinary centre. There are not any... Uh, real interdisciplinary centres at the university. You've got your engineering departments, you've got your design departments, you've got humanities, you've got health sciences, but you know, unless someone initiates an interdisciplinary project, uh, it probably won't happen very easily. Um, it's also a lab that is trying to generate international research. And having spent the last seven years uh, in London and then also having done residencies in the US, uh, I, I think we're positioned to be able to do that. We're certainly going to be using uh, biomimicry to uh, generate some novel uh, prosthetic devices. I mean, there's now a trend for engineering more aesthetic prosthetics. In other words, people no longer, if they have a, an artificial hand, they're no longer concerned that they're going to fool you that it's a real hand. They don't want a, a, a creepy skin that looks like a real hand but doesn't really feel like one. They're happy that you know, the carbon fibre mechanism or the stainless steel mechanism is exposed. And some, some of us are designing uh, prosthetic devices that are you know, more beautiful to look at and there's no uh, attempt to mimic what, uh, say, the human skin is like. But there's also, of course, the concern with ethics. If we're going to be in attaching technology uh, into the body, uh, we can now, in fact, do surgical procedures on, fetus, on, on, on unborn fetuses, right? Uh, and not only that, uh, soon on embryos with micro-miniaturised uh, technologies. So if, you, if, if, if you know, your baby is detected with some pathological condition, it might be able to be treated uh, surgically. Um, so what are the sort of, not only the aesthetics involved in, in attachments or insertions inside our body, but what are the ethics? So interrogating both the aesthetics and the ethics is the kind of humanities side of things that we're doing here. Um, and of course, that interest in identity, embodiment and agency. You know, what constitutes uh, what it means to be a person, what it means to be human. Uh, and of course, the realisation is that what it means to be human is determined uh, historically, uh, culturally, uh, and by the technology that are, are available. If you're a Heideggerian, you accept the fact that you're kind of thrown into the world at a particular time in history, and that's where you are. Uh, you've got to make do with uh, state of the art kind of thing. But what's interesting for us is to consider uh, engineering uh, contestable futures. As artists, we're not interested necessarily in doing methodical scientific research for immediate utilitarian use, but rather generating contestable futures, contestable possibilities that might be examined uh, possibly appropriated, often discarded, but it will it, it sort of contribute to that discussion and that interrogation of uh, what it means to be human. At the moment, we have uh, a 16 micron resolution 3D printer in our lab. It is the highest resolution 3D printer on campus. So we've already generated collaborations 
with mechanical engineering, with computer science, uh, with a, a, a musician, uh, who are all interested in using that incredibly precise 3D printing technology. Um, and we've also got uh, uh, several portable uh, 3D scanners. So we can scan a face, 3D print it at any scale. Uh, we can scan, uh, scan say, your, your left arm and, uh, you know, if you need a prosthesis, uh, you know, scan, use that data, mirror it and produce uh, the dimensions of, of, of a prosthesis that might replace um, your, your lost hand. Um, in fact, at the moment, we're helping a person who uh, has had a tracheostomy and uh, 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 the device that she wears, the, the collar and, and the, the device that she wears, uh, the company who was producing those uh, stopped producing them. And the only other ones available are these very uncomfortable, very large protruding ones. Um, and you, with our 3D printing system and uh, uh, casting silicon techniques, uh, we're, we're going to, well, we are, we're sort of almost, uh, uh, we've already produced uh, a sample that uh, she's begun to, to test uh, very soon. So that's something that uh, we're not necessarily wanting uh, or advertising to do, but it's someone who's come to us with a, a particular problem. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, the lab will uh, generate a lot more interest, uh, some funding for additional equipment, and um, we're hopeful that in the five years that I'll be here that uh, it'll become a viable and truly interdisciplinary and international uh, research uh, uh, focus. Thanks very much. Sorry about that.